So, welcome everybody. Our speaker today is Francesco Palmorella from ETH Zurich. Um, and he will talk about his PhD thesis, which is the parametric approach to the Wilmer flow. Please go ahead. Yes, thanks a lot. Uh, so I'm going to talk with you about this last part of my PhD thesis about uh, concerning the parametric approach to the Wilmer flow. Uh, and everything I say is joint work in uh, collaboration with Tristan Livier. So my one of my advisors. Right. So um, let me start by recalling a very few basics about the Wilmore energy. Many in the audience know them very well, but let's, let's have a brief um, recap. So the Wilmore energy of an immersed surface S uh, into the Euclidean space, and for me, immersed surface is always 2D, okay? Classically is the following quantity, namely is the integral of the norm squared of the uh, mean curvature uh, with respect to the induced uh, area element uh, induced from the immersion. And so up to now, it's a quantity that really depends on how this surface, for instance, uh, sphere, torus, and so on, is immersed. Now, I, I let me say immediately that you may find the name Wilmore energy attached to two possible variants uh, uh, of, this, of the classical version. Namely here, we have a, here a normalization factor, okay? But you see here we have the full norm of the second fundamental form, or also uh, up to this factor here, you can find uh, the name Wilmore energy for this variant where A circ here is only the trace free part uh, of the second fundamental form, which is this one, G is the induced metric. And the reason why they, may be uh, called with the same name is the following pointwise identity. So you see K here is the Gauss curvature. And here you have precisely the three integrants with the, and, and this explain also to you why this normalization takes place. And this means that um, with the gauss bonnet theorem, these three Lagrangians uh, over defined over immersions, if you're working of say close smooth surface with the same genus are completely equivalent from a variational point of view, no? at least up to when you, 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 you work with smooth uh, immersions. And thus in particular, they have the same Euler-Lagrange operator, no? which is the Wilmer operator, which I wrote here in the classical form. Here I'm denoting nabla perp. Uh, as the Laplace over the normal bundle of your surface, immersed surface, applied to the, to the mean curvature. And the second term here is a sort of um, doubly contracted triple product here between the trace free second fundamental form and, and uh, mean curvature vector. So this is the induced metric. And of course, this is also, the Laplace is also with respect to this uh, metric uh, over the normal bundle. Now, uh, what I wrote is completely correct, only that if you are not acquainted with this operator, perhaps uh, the fog dissipates a bit if you look at the co-dimension one. In fact, this expression here, the second term, reduces simply to the norm squared of the trace free second fundamental form times h. So you can see. And even more, if you're willing to work with the Gauss map, so n no, is the Gauss map of you are in 3D and you can talk about scalar mean curvature in, with this symbol, then the Lagrangian is encoded by this scalar expression here, where now this is just a usual uh, Laplace or Beltrami operator, if you want, over functions. And now this is just the expansion of this case, the Gauss curvature. And now maybe let's just notice here that the expression this is a classical expression written as it is, is sort of cubic in the mean curvature, while the Wilmore Lagrangian is the integral of the quadratic uh, of the quadratic power of the mean curvature. So you can already tell if you do calculus of variations that the situation somehow, if you do analysis of Wilmore surface, is going to be interesting. Hmm? Okay, and then of course a Wilmore surface is is. Uh, 
surface such that this operator vanishes identically. And this, of course, applies also to uh, non-closed surfaces, unbounded, and so on. All right. And um, OK, uh, you may be satisfied with the analytical definition. You may be, it's been enough for you, but maybe you want some more motivation on why, on why one should consider this Lagrangian, which uh, whose Euler Lagrange equation is uh, quite frightening, right? In fact, so I'm going to give you very briefly uh, a few motivations. So in fact, first of all, uh, this is the oldest probably uh, appearance of the Wilmore energy. It can be um, used as a nonlinear model for uh, inelasticity theory for elastic plates. Uh, Variants of this hypothesis are still in use nowadays. So the first to, to do this were Germain and Poisson. But also, uh, if you're looking at, for some reason, at uh, minimal surfaces and you have to add conformal invariance to your, um, to your studies, uh, you end up with Wilmore surfaces. I will say a few things more in a moment about this. And sorry, somebody says something? No, sorry. Uh, and also, okay, let me just uh, say that uh, you can find the Wilmore energy uh, in some certain models uh, in cell biology, theoretical cell biology. And finally, the Wilmore energy is also the uh, main term in the Hawking quasi local mass in general relativity theory. All right, so let's say a few words about this second bullet here. Blaschke and Thompson uh, in around the 20s realized that uh, being a Wilmore. Uh, surface is a conformal invariant notion in the Euclidean space. Thus, as I already said, if you have to merge minimal surfaces and conformal invariants, the natural object you end up with is Wilmore surfaces. This can be made very concrete. Imagine, for instance, that you are looking at minimal surfaces which are unbounded no, in the Euclidean space, and for some reason you have to compactify them. No? Then, then um, so being conformal invariant means that the Wilmer surface is not only, uh, so the, the concept of being Wilmer is not the same for translations, rotations, and uh, dilation, but also, and most importantly, through spherical inversions. So if you compact, if you have to compactify, say, a minimal surface, you normally do it through spherical inversion, but the resulting surface is not Wilmer anymore. Uh, sorry, is not minimal anymore. For instance, it's compact but it's going to be Wilmer, at least away from the singularity, right? Or another example, for instance, is imagine you're studying minimal surfaces on the sphere, Sn, and you want to pull this back, uh, you want to pull a minimal surface back uh, via stereographic projection, then the resulting surface that you get is not minimal on the Euclidean space, typically, but it's going to be Wilmer. In fact, this conformal invariance can be made more quantitative following a result of Chen of 1974. Uh, because the Wilmore energy density in the trace free version part is a really pointwise conformal invariant. This has very precise, very meaningful uh, consequences in the study, uh, in the analysis of Wilmore surfaces. Maybe I will say something more at the end. And also, let me mention that. Uh, at least in co-dimension one, in R3, you can prove uh, Mondino and Guyen here. One can also have a look at this uh, paper by Bryant in, of the 80s, that the Wilmore energy essentially is the only conformal invariant uh, Lagrangian, let's say, for surfaces. So if a Lagrangian defined over all the immersion of a given surface satisfies the invariance with respect to the full uh, conformal group of R, and then it's a, a fine combination of the Wilmer surface. All right. This is as much as, um, as I wanted to say for general Wilmer energy. Let me let, let's go near. Uh, let's draw closer to, to 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 the subject of the present talk by introducing the gradient, the Wilmer gradient flow. So, what's the idea? The idea behind the Wilmer flow is let's say, to deform continuously a given surface to a Wilmer surface by decreasing efficiently the Wilmer energy. So this is, of course, the basic idea behind every gradient flow associated to a Lagrangian starting with the with heat equation. So let's be more precise. 
So a Widmer flow is a one parameter family of immersions, pi, where sigma here is a topological surface, let's say sphere or torus or so on. And this is the space of parameter so that the velocity in the parameter equates the negative Wilmer operator for every of the immersion for every time. And then if you want, uh, you can add uh, a tangential component. So typically what is done here is that the tangential component is not in the definition, but let's say that if everything is smooth enough, this can always be achieved by means of a parameterization. And in fact, this is a kind of uh, Bijective correspondence, if the surface is closed, every family of tangential vector field can be absorbed by reparameterizing, and every family of reparameterization uh, appears in a tangential component when you, when you, uh, by the chain rule essentially. Now, okay, so what does it mean efficiently? Well, at least if everything is smooth enough. Uh, a Wilmer flow like this satisfies the energy identity, right? This is the, the, the precise meaning of this, namely the difference of the Wilmer energy at the time t and the one at the initial time equates um, the negative L2 norm of the Wilmer operator in space time. So basically, very roughly speaking, um, if you, if you, if you're able to, to, to do an effective analysis of a, Wilm of a Wilmer flow, if you can, well, for instance, uh, studies effectively the singularities and uh, say what happens uh, uh, when, 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 when you hit uh, singular times, eventually you will be able to achieve your continuous deformation to Wilmer surface, or at least you will gain much of insight in uh, being able to say why this cannot happen. This is general idea. All right, so uh, the study of the um, Wilmer gradient flow was introduced by Kuvert and Schätzle and also by Simonet in the first year of the 2000s. And in particular, uh, let's say the main results of the works of Kuvert and Schätzle can be uh, summarized as follows. So Kuvert and Schätzle consider the in Cauchy initial value problem for the Wilmer flow, so no tangential component, and they proved what follows. They proved that there exists an epsilon zero so that if uh, the initial immersion here, smooth, uh, has Wilmer energy not uh, above epsilon zero, then uh, there exists, uh, so the, the, the Cauchy problem admits a unique solution in the smooth category which exists for every time and converges smoothly to a round sphere as t goes to plus infinity. All right, let me comment immediately on this result. Uh, so first of all, so if epsilon zero is small, then it is a fairly simple matter using the definition of Wilmore energy and the gauss bonnet theorem to see that the topology of sigma has to be a sphere. So this is a trace-free part eh, version of the Wilmore energy. So working with small initial energy already confines you to, to working with spheres. Uh, on the other hand, however, this uh, variant of the Wilmore energy is the only one that can be taken globally small. The other two variants, you know, the, the classical one and the one with the full uh, second fundamental form that are somehow more coercive, all have lower bounds. And correctly, when you study, when, when you approach a new evolution equation, you, you, you want to work with the simplest possible assumption. Uh, so in particular, small energy is one of these, you know? And, but this is the only way you can do that. So if you want to work with small initial energy, you are going to consider only spheres. Most importantly, however, this results pertains to the smooth category. So this is important. So what do I mean by this? So imagine that at any rate, you are happy with a smooth initial datum here. Now, however, since this equation is highly nonlinear in Pi, it makes a lot of difference on where you set your problem to be, in a Sobolev class, a Holder class, or very, very smooth class. It, it, so experience teaches essentially that, uh, as is the case for other um, 
geometric flow, that for instance, the harmonic map flow. If you enlarge your class uh, enough so that you still have a meaning to a weak meaning to the equation, but uh, there are enough enough uh, maps in the class where you are, then uh, the study becomes more difficult. And the smooth solution, which typically is only uh, you always exist at least for uh, some maximal time, may not be the only one. There can be weak solutions that, for instance, are pathological or that do not preserve the energy inequality and so on. But however, you don't just enlarge the class because, because you have nothing to do, but uh, because uh, energy level theory is required to study the, to an effective study of singularities, an effective study of bubbling analysis, energy quantization, all the methods that per se cannot are not in reach uh, if you just restrict yourself to smooth uh, function. So you need eventually an energy level theory. So of course, uh, the example I have in mind here is the one of the 2D harmonic map flow. So the 2D harmonic map flow was introduced by um, Ilse and Samson in 1964, I think. But it was only with uh, after the work of Struve that which then was complemented by other authors here are some that uh, effective energy the level theory could be achieved and in particular you could uh, finally see uh, you know what are the finite space time singularities and then the flow essentially after this uh, study of weak solution could be, be very could be quite useful in many many situations let's say and you had a clear picture no, of, the, of, the, of the behavior of the PD. And so uh, for the Wilmore, for the Wilmore um, setting, there is a very strong evidence that uh, the same can be done, or at least a very, very similar, uh, let's say, story will be told if you look at it with a parametric approach that was introduced by Tristan, uh, starting from 2008, uh, then and also uh, other people complemented by them. Because, um, uh, so some of these points for the time independent case were achieved through this method. So the project is okay, let's try to see, let's try to carry this parametric theory to the flow. Let's see, let's see uh, what can be done. Right. Uh, well, clearly you immediately see that uh, there are many things to be kept in check. So we said, okay, in this first work, we also work in the, try to work with the simplest possible assumption. And in particular, we confined ourselves in a small energy regime. I will be more precise with this. And also we uh, work in co-dimension one, in R3, not in Rn3. So these two assumptions have a very peculiar set of advantages. So the first one I already said, uh, like, like before, you uh, have the, the only possibilities is that you work with spheres, and uh, this is very this is very meaningful for for parametric theory. I uh, you will see why later. Uh, then there is a technical. So working to dimension one has a technical advantage, namely that um, you have a Gauss map, so the calculations and the notation are much easier. So. Uh, it's cleaner somehow. You really see, uh, you, you can really, you do not have to struggle with um, higher co-dimension calculation. And then, okay, uh, as is always the case, typically we, when you have small emission energy, and this is the case also here in evolution equation, you can get by using only elliptic theory and, you know, uh, interpolate uh, slice-wise elliptic theory, and then you interpolate with Gagliard and Nirenberg and use the fact that the energy is small. And this is also the case here. But perhaps the most important point uh, that the most important um, simplification that comes by assuming these two is the fact that we have at our disposal a very useful tool, the Delelis and Euler theorem, about which you will know soon. All right. Uh, Perhaps it's worth before uh, going, uh, going on to really say a few words about this parametric theory because uh, it will facilitate the, the, the understanding of our results later. All right, you can take for instance, sigma to be the sphere or if you like uh, the, the, the unit disk of R2. So what's the central notion of this theory is the following. 
So a weak immersion of sigma into Rn is a map belonging to this set, which is just the set of map in W22, Sobolev space, which are also Lipschitz immersions. So what do I mean by, well, okay, W22, but what do I mean by Lipschitz immersion? I simply mean that you have a Lipschitz map, which in addition, if you consider the rough uh, metric tensor, which induces on, 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 the, on the topological manifold, on the sphere, for instance, then this is okay, bounded measurable, but it satisfies almost everywhere the non-degeneracy condition of being a metric. This just means Lipschitz immersion. Now notice carefully, okay, this is needed to make sense of an immersion and W22. Now, if you remember the Wilmore energy is the integral of the mean curvature square, which basically means that two derivatives in L2 are enough to make sense of the Wilmore energy. And this is precisely the energy level theory requirement. No? You, can, you can guess if you know uh, the basis of calculus of variation that this is an energy level theory. Still, uh, okay, despite this set being quite large, every map here, there is this fundamental fact that there is a conformal representative. Uh, they admit the conformal reparameterization. This is the accumulation of a work of many people, of course. I listed here some, I hope all, but I'm not sure. And the fact that you, you are conformal at this weak energy level is very important because uh, you have very subtle sort of uh, arguments concerning estimates and the conformal factor. So it's really, um, this is really a crucial fact hmm, that you keep in mind. And okay, so most importantly, uh, every map here has a distributional Wilmore operator. So what do I mean by that? Um, if you remember, the classical form of the Wilmore equation here contained a cubic expression in the mean curvature, if you write it simply uh, like that. But now here, uh, this would be a very, very annoying, right? Because we wouldn't have enough regularity if you want this energy level theory to... to, to, to to get through, but fortunately you're quite happy because the um, Wilmore operator admits a uh, rewriting in a so-called divergence form. So this is a sort of divergence operator. These two are equivalent eh? uh, when surfaces are smooth, but you see here in this class, you have a mean curvature in L2, a second fundamental form in L2. So this is L1, similar this is L1. This is a distribution because uh, mean curvature in L2, and this is a divergence type operator. So this expression, okay, you have to multiply by the volume element, but that's okay, is a very well-defined distribution in some negative Sobolev space, and this is perfect for the uh, analysis of weak Wilmore immersions that uh, has been proven so useful. Okay, but then, okay, what are we going to do no, in the present case? Because this is just a preliminary. So basically, we are going to consider the Cauchy initial value problem for the conformal Wilmer flow. So in other words, we consider a initial datum given by a conformal immersion. This can always be done, right? Conformal reparameterization exists under you know, very weak assumptions. And you consider the Cauchy problem like that, only that you say, I add to my, to my flow a tangential component, which is going to be responsible for keeping the flow conformal for every time. So you remember I was saying there is this bijective uh, sort of uh, correspondence between tangential components and reparameterization. This is exactly used in this idea here. Okay, let me give you even one more reason why this is going to be a good idea to study such, pro, uh, such uh, conformal gauge for the Wilmot flow. So imagine you are in this setting. So imagine that you have a uh, metric which is conformal. So if G is, say, the metric of phi for, uh, for every fixed T, then it's conformal. So it means there is a conformal factor, and this is the standard, uh, for instance, background metric of the, of the sphere, 
then if you write the Wilmore equation, so the Wilmore operator, you realize that the highest order term in, 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 in terms of derivatives is the standard by Laplace. Okay, there is a term here which you had to take into account. And then there is just lower order term. And this means precisely that the operator in conformal gauge is uniformly elliptic provided you can control in the subnorm from above and below this, uh, this term here. I mean, why am I saying that? Because if you take uh, no, for instance, no, no, conformal, uh, no conformal gauge, then the Wilmore operator is a tensor, of course, which is invariant under the parameterization in the domain. So this means that the equation is going to be uh, degenerate elliptic and the corresponding flow is going to be de degenerate parabolic. Uh, this is a very well-known feature for those who study, you know, the mean curvature flow. So the mean curvature is, uh, flow is, uh, seems to be like the, the heat equation, no? but this is deceptive because the, the, the metric over which you are taking the Laplace depends on the immersion itself. And then in that case, there is the third trick, and uh, which is quite clever, or, or you have to use, you know, Nash-Moser, so it's really not uh to be to to be underestimated okay there is another very good news once you 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 start looking at this the fact that you uh, has to satisfy a uniform elliptic always solvable equation on s2 now i didn't write it down but maybe, maybe perhaps it's not so illuminating but you know it's a elliptic equation in one complex variable so this is not surprising no given in for surfaces the relation that exists between conformal and complex structure you get an, ex, uh, an equation which is best expressed in complex coordinate but since you are on s2 okay i make a very long story short there is no um, non-trivial quadratic differential and so the equation that you satisfy is time by time always solvable and you like this a lot Okay, but there are not just good news because, in fact, um, if I would tell you that I would start studying just a conformal flow, just like that, you would, you would tell me, but are you sure? Because, you know, uh, conformal flow is not unique. So the problem, as I, as I defined like that, is not very well defined. Why? Simple, because the set of conformal set maps of S2, the, basically the biolomorphic, Diffeomorphism uh, has complex dimension six. So there is a gauge, another kind of gauge uh, uh, fixing to be done. But if you agree with me that six is much less than infinity, hmm, then you probably also believe me that there is a sufficiently simple gauge fixing constraint, which we call well balanced constraint. Okay, here's the definition, but okay. So immersion is well balanced if two, these two integral conditions hold where I is the standard and bending. So what is important to retain here is that you see this has dimension six and this is three equation because this is a vector function and this is again three equations. And well, if you know anything about the classical plateau problem, no, the solution by that we study in calculus of variation by Douglas, Radon, Courant, you remember that at one point there was uh, there was this three point uh, normalization condition which had to be imposed to tame the gauge of the group action so that the group action of the of the conformal uh, group of the disk and this is very similar so nothing new if you know the plateau problem for instance all right but not not all our struggles are over I mean, they're never over, but so in this case, because at the beginning, so, okay, you know that, what about the initial datum? You know that it has to be um, conformal, but again, conformal, there are many conformal parameterization and uh, there is no boundary, so how to choose? And here comes the very useful result of the Lelis and Neumann. Let, let me, let, let us read it because it's really, so there exists uh, an epsilon zero so that if you pick an immersed surface with a area normalized to be for pi and whose Wilmore energy is not above epsilon zero, the trace-free Wilmore energy, then there exists a 
special, let's say, conformal parametrization so that the following holds. So you have a W, so the, the difference between this immersion and the standard embedding of the sphere, like the, the one where the sphere sits in R3, is up to a constant here controlled in W22. And the conformal factor, uh, so the difference between the conformal factor and one is uh, controlling the SAT norm, both the controls being, F, um, let's say, effective in terms of the Wilmore energy. And this is really, uh, when, you, when you do this theory, you really see this, this really fits the purpose because this is really a control that allows you to, in particular, this one is really, the, 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 the correct tool to, 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 to use in this case. And you believe me that uh, if I tell you that this gives you a convenient choice no? among all the possible one for the parametrization. Right, and so, so okay, we have all the elements. No? So we said, so what is the big energy class where, which we can now consider? So much bigger than the smooth class. So the let me give you this definition. For every epsilon, delta, and t positive, you consider your class to be the one given by the set of all measurable maps, phi, uh, so that, well, first of all, for almost every t, you are a weak uh, and uh, conformally measured. Conformal is not written, but uh, you are weak conformal. Then the sort of the, sort of the um, the Lelis and Mueller control sort of holds uniformly in time at the level delta. This is, uh, so for now, this is just a definition. So every delta for now. And here's the central part that uh, many people will know from the flow theory. Um, the Wilmore operator is in L2 of the space time and the energy identity holds for almost every time. Now. This is the typical thing no, that you encounter in flow. When the flow is smooth enough, the energy identity is true. But when you consider weak solutions, sufficiently weak, the energy identity has to be taken as, a, as an axiom in your class. Because otherwise, there are a lot of pathological solutions. For instance, in the harmonic power flow, this is uh, very well uh, documented. And again, okay, uh, we ask that phi is well balanced for almost every time. And what is the good news? The good news is that conformal Wilmer flow have a well-defined distributional meaning. I mean, the parabolic equation has a very, uh, very well-defined distributional meaning in this class. And uh, this class is quite large. It's prototyped to be uh, the, the, a class of energy level. Uh, from an energy level theory. Okay, there is also um, a class of initial data. So, okay, if you're happy just with smooth initial data, you, you don't care. But in the end, you have to care also for weak initial data. So the optimal set would be uh, E, and this is uh, would be at least uh, definitely the one that you want to, to achieve. So for the moment, and uh, we have a set, we have defined a set, the fine tour approximation, which definitely contains all smooth immersions with um, sufficiently small initial Wilmore energy. And we believe it's either already coincides with E or it's uh, slightly smaller. This is uh, one of the things that will be addressed in the future. So imagine it as an intermediate for the moment, not too big. Sorry, but also uh, not small, uh, smooth, uh, C infinity small. All right, and so what's the result? The result is the following. So um, there exists an epsilon zero, so that if you pick any um, weak, com conformal, if you want, initial datum with Wilmore energy not above epsilon zero, then the Cauchy problem for the conformal Wilmer flow, I wrote it here once again, has a weak solution in the energy class for some delta. So delta is just like a dummy variable. You, you choose some delta and then you're happy with that, which is smooth for 
every uh, positive time, which converges smoothly as t goes to infinity to the standard embedding of the sphere. And it's smooth up to t equals zero and also unique if the initial datum is smooth. Right, so this is the result. Okay, let's perhaps compare it with the one by Kuver and Schätzle. Okay, to compare it, of course, you need to take smooth initial datum, right? Which is already not the case for this theory, but imagine you take smooth initial datum. So the existence is in a much larger class. This is the first, the, the, the most important thing that we wanted to achieve. But also it's a feature of the um, parametric theory that the convergence that you get is not to some round sphere of some radius and some center as it is in Kuber uh, and Schätzle's work, but it is exactly to the uh, standard embedding. So, okay, let me just say uh, very useful to also precisely achieve this as a recent work of Kuber and Scheuer, which is you know, in the original spirit, but provides uh, some very useful asymptotic estimates that help this. And okay, so um, as I said, uh, oh, maybe I didn't say that, but let's say now, we expect, uh, of course, with uh, uniqueness for any initial data among the one which I mentioned. This is one of the things, so typically this is done with grown world, you know, inequality, but somehow uh, the argument was a bit too long. We believe there is a shorter way, uh, maybe to be uh, written down in the future, but the expectation is quite um, unexceptional, I would say. All right, so uh, that's the result. Maybe you want to know, uh, among the many things, what's the central ingredient, right? So I was saying at the beginning that um, when the initial energy is small, typically you can get away with uh, just with elliptic estimate and then slice-wise integration. So this is the case here. Uh, long story short, what is that you want essentially you want the following you want to prove the following so imagine you take now uh, this is a local result so this is a regularity result imagine you take the unit disk and you have a conformal weak immersion and you know that this conformal weak immersion happens to have the wilmore operator in it too then as is the case for a fourth order elliptic equation you want to prove that this is w42 log no uh, the equation is nonlinear, so this is not guaranteed, of course. Uh, but okay, this is not enough for the flow because you also want to prove that if the Wilmore energy is small, and know that we are working locally, so I may as well take the strongest possible Wilmore energy, then I also have an elliptic estimate. You see, um, I put d phi because I want to keep the translation invariance because the Wilmore equation is translation invariance. Then I can measure the essentially W42 norms in terms of, well, uh, something taking care of the fact that I am not considering boundary conditions and the Wilmore operator. No? This would be like if the equation were, let's say, linear, this would be a linear estimate, only that, of course, the equation is not linear, and so you want this. And uh, you may say, okay, but then you do, it's the usual stuff, you know, Gagliardo, Nirenberg, and so on. The thing is that it's not exactly the case because you see, even if the, the Wilmore equation makes sense, as I said in the, this set here, uh, it's critical. So what do I mean by that? You write it in the divergent form and then you split the two terms, of course. This is the one you have to apply your elliptic theory. Like imagine this is more or less the by Laplace, but this one, so this is a divergence type operator, but this is in L1. So L1 is really one of the, one of the limiting case of the standard elliptic theory that you cannot apply like Cardinal and Zygmunt and so on. So written as it is, you cannot, so you end up with H being just in L2, you do not improve. And so how's, uh, how's the, wh which game are you going to play? Well, you remember at the beginning, you use the fact that the Wilmore, uh, the Wilmore energy density here is a conformal invariant because, 
So how do we use this fact quantitatively? Well, with Netter's theorem, the fact that this is conformal invariant gives you uh, for every one parameter family, you know, of, of uh, invariance produces an equation. No? This is the classical mechanics that we are, uh, course that we all learn, no? the Netter's theorem. So the invariance by dilation constitutes a family and gives you one new equation. Same with the invariance by rotation and same with the invariance by immersions. So this is strictly not a family, but you make a family by composing rotation with translations. So with all this new equation you get, first of all, you say, but, but what am I going to do? But if you look at them very, uh, you have to be in a sense, very subtle in this, if you get your hands very dipped in the end, you realize that if you use this new equation, and then if you use, I would say standard Hodge decomposition more or less, then if you add to it uh, integrability by compensation, you realize that all these equations here with the, together with the Wilmore equation, give you a very peculiar system that thanks to integrability compensation, if you went as lemma, if you want, um, are able to produce a regularity improvement. You can prove, for instance, that the mean curvature is in LP log for P bigger than two. And at that point, you said, okay, I forget about all this. I have P bigger than two, and this equation puts stops. And this is the main point. So the fact that you are inhomogeneous Wilmore is not a problem. Like uh, you have dust, in a sense, which you, which is not the problem, but the the, 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 the crucial point is to merge these uh, equations, which apparently uh, you have nothing to do with them, with the Hodge decomposition and integrability by compensation. All right. So uh, this is it. I would say I've said uh, more than enough for the present work, but let me just say that. Of course, uh, if one plans to develop this theory further, there are many challenges ahead because this is very promising to achieve, for instance, energy quantization for the flow. But there are many things you have to consider, right? Because the parametric theory carries uh, new challenges. So for instance, imagine I just listed three here. Imagine for instance that uh, you want to consider flow of spheres, but with arbitrary initial energy. No? So the delelis muller is a very useful and very fun tool, but you cannot expect to, to, to push it too much. So this requires new ideas. And of course, eventually you want to study flows for other uh, uh, surfaces like torus or even hyperbolic surfaces of higher genus. But in that case, you know, the parametric theory cares very much about the, the conformal parametrization, but in that case, there is more than one conformal class. And then you get the take Muller space, and then you have to choose and then to, 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 to make decision on which uh, conformal class am I choosing? How is the uh, conformal class evolving along the flow? No? And then of course, uh, eventually you have to study singularities. No? Of course, there are already some, uh, some results uh, concerning the singularity of Wilmot flow, but I would say um, the, 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 the precise, so for instance, it's not uh, known unless it's as very extremely recent, whether the Wilmot flow develops singularity at finite or infinite time. So you have to settle all this kind of, uh, of uh, question first. Um, and for the flow even more, because typically a singularity you know, uh, appears um, by means of energy concentration, energy concentration of the second fundamental form. But for the flow, of course, you also have the conformal, the evolution of the conformal class to be kept in check. This is the, what you pay for having a stronger control on the, on, on the maps. And you have to take all these problems as well and, uh, you know, the, 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 surely if you, if you, if you have the energy, the, the energy, like mental energy, there is a plenty of uh, problems await. And with this, I think it's, uh, I've said everything that I wanted to say, and I thank you a lot for your time and your patience and uh, that's it.
Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.